Welcome to Strange Familiars. How are you doing tonight, Allison? I'm okay. Good to know. We were all wondering. <laughs> Before we get going, I want to thank Derek R. He sent me this book, Logging in the Pennsylvania North Woods, a pictorial presentation of the period when Penn's Woods was our nation's leading lumbering state. He didn't just send it to me because it's Pennsylvania. It's got a story about a hermit named the Wild Boy in it. Want me to read it? Sure. A little hermit story to start. Is this Duran Duran related? No. Okay. The Wild Boy. The stream called the Wild Boy was actually named after an unusual young settler who built a crude hut on the East Fork in Potter County in 1842. Do you know Potter County, Allison? That's God's country, I think, as, as far as the Pennsylvania lore goes, is it not? Living a solitary life six miles from the nearest neighbor, the hermit avoided other humans who soon came to refer to him as the Wild Boy, and it was years before anyone knew his actual given name. According to W. W. Thompson, founder of the Potter Enterprise in 1874, the Wild Boy's real name was Louis Stevens, and he was born in 1825 at Toms River, New Jersey. As a young boy, Stevens was unable to bear the life at home with his drunken father and a stepmother of similar habits. Leaving home at age 11, the youngster tramped the countryside, and along the way he learned the rudiments of tinsmithing and became an itinerant tinker. At age 17, when wandering up the cinema honing, do you know the cinema honing? No, not at all. <laughs> and noticing settlers sparsely distributed, he decided the region would offer an abundant and quiet life, so he made a forest dwelling of logs, mud, and moss, and by hunting game, fishing trout, and gathering berries and nuts, he lived off the land. The wild boy made occasional trips from his mountain home, sometimes tinkering his way as far as Connecticut. He also twice enlisted in military ventures, in 1845 when he joined as a soldier for the Mexican War, and again in 1861 when he enlisted in the 46th Regiment of Pennsylvania Volunteers. In the latter experience, according to tradition, he was so dissatisfied with being compelled to salute officers that he deserted. Louis Stevens, the wild boy, was a loner, but he wasn't any more wild than any of the other settlers of the mountains. But then again, the stream that is named after him isn't any wilder than other creeks either. That's the whole story? That's we don't know anything about his life? That's the whole story. We might be able to find more on that's the wild That's a tease. Boy. Yeah. That's a, that's, an, that's a hermit tease. So Derek R. sent me that. Another thing Derek did that I'm very jealous. He and his family went looking for and found. They found English Jack's cabin. English Jack is in New Hampshire, oh, White okay. Mountains. Oh, okay. That's the one we were just talking about, the, in Franconia? Or yeah, the, okay. yeah, yeah, the one we just talked oh, about. Oh, okay. He and his family went, and they found they found the remnants of the cabin. They found a bunch of old stuff, including, like, some old bottles and stuff. I'm very jealous. That's really cool. But okay. he did say he'd take me to it if I went up there, so. Sounds like a plan. It does sound like a plan. So thanks for the book, Derek, and thanks for sharing your adventure, finding... English Jack's Cabin. All right. That's not what tonight's show is about, though. We're not even going to talk about hermits. It's not even a hermit show. Another interesting character, though. And before we get to that, let's just quickly thank our patrons. Thank you, patrons. Thank you for what you do. Thank you for your support. We could not make Strange Familiars without you. If you like what we do and you'd like to get extra content besides, you can become a patron at Patreon, patreon.com slash strangefamiliars. All of our patrons get commercial-free versions of the weekly show, plus two full extra episodes every month, exclusive for our patrons. To check it out again, go to patreon.com slash strangefamiliars. All right, Allison. Yes. Let's get into some channeling. I'm going to channel a competent podcaster. <laughs> And become one you, for the evening. I was going to start off the show with my Dr. Peebles voice. I should have done it. Please don't. <laughs> <laughs> it gives me a lot of secondhand embarrassment. When I do it or when anyone does when it? When anyone does it. Yeah. 
it's just it's a personal thing mm -hmm. i also cannot really enjoy musical theater on most levels i just mm -hmm. i also can't dance in front of people mm -hmm. and i can't really have my picture taken so <laughs> i feel like this is a me issue <laughs> oh i want to do my dr people's voice okay so let's let's talk about who we're i mean you've kind of introduced him i've introduced him not at all honestly <laughs> So yeah, so who is Dr. Peoples' health? Dr. Peoples was a spiritualist in the 1800s who has had an even more exciting life post-death than most people have during their regular lives. Ooh, interesting. Now, am I saying his name wrong? Is it Peoples or Peebles? It's Peebles. But when you say it, like it's, it ends up sounding like the plural of people. Mm -hmm. But it's Peebles. Dr. James Martin Peoples. How did you first hear of Dr. Peebles' health? Well, this is an interesting story, and I've wanted to tell this story for a while, but I didn't really want to offend the people from whom I learned about Dr. Peebles, but I feel like I'm far enough removed away from seeing them <laughs> <laughs> and the likelihood of, of their listening to this is probably slim. Well, we're not going to name names anymore. No, and I'm not going to be disrespectful because these are people I, I really, really loved at the time. And not that I don't love them now, but they were part of a circle of people that I interacted with on a regular basis. I don't happen to now just because circumstances have changed. And this is not in any attempt to parody them mm -hmm. or their beliefs. They have different beliefs than me. That's totally fine. My interest is in this odd character and the odd characters that surround him both pre- and post-death. Now, I will say, I tried to get you to tell this story for the show probably a few months after we started it, and at that time you were like, no, no, I'm not going to do this. I guess you're just too close to the to everything. You know, well, to... I'll, I'll just be honest. These are people I used to work with, mm -hmm. and I don't have that job anymore. <laughs> <laughs> so I don't see them as often. But for years and years and years, the people I work with in this sort of extended family that went beyond that, I was quite close to. Mm -hmm. That's the only reason I would have kind of been let in on this from the get-go. Mm -hmm. So amongst these people, they started talking about Dr. Peoples, listening to him talk. And he was being channeled by someone, and many people channel him today. It's one of the people that currently channel him. I'm not going to mention which one of these people it was. And they started to get lots of messages from Dr. Peoples, helpful messages about how to live life from a very spiritualist point of view. And I just assumed at the time that this was a totally made up character by the channeler mm -hmm. who came up with this character that they were channeling. Mm -hmm. And I didn't really give it too much more thought than that. I mean, it was a curiosity to me. Like, while I didn't believe in it, and I, it's going to be a big leap for me to believe that people are, are channeled. I'm just, yeah. that's my point of view. Mm -hmm. That doesn't have to be everybody's. I understand why people would believe that it could be true. That's not really my premise here. But they started to become more and more involved in these messages and even started to do some channeling themselves and some automatic writing, which I think probably has merit, psychological or spiritual point of view. And I kind of, I was curious, so I kind of indulged enough to get some more information about it and just to sort of like, because I, I like hearing how people work and mm -hmm. what they think, mm -hmm. even if it's not something I believe in. So one of the people in the group started channeling messages from Dr. Peoples as well, but then was informed by the channeler who does this professionally. The one that they were... That they were initially listening initially to. Initially listening to, okay, yeah. Told this person that they were not in fact channeling Dr. Peoples, but his trickster younger brother. And the whole thing just got into this complicated drama of like they're wanting to listen to the channeler uh, channel Dr. Peoples and everything he had to say but at the same time there being this competitive nature to it which I have only recently found is a microcosm of what's been going on for like 200 years Wow! <laughs> and it, the funny part about it is that I thoroughly thought that this was a made-up person mm -hmm. no historical context whatsoever you and I would can't channel Dr. Peoples I'm channeling Dr. Peoples. <laughs> yeah, kind of like that. Yeah. Did you say what this person told your friend? Yeah, that they were actually channeling the trickster younger brother. Yeah. Which until like three days ago, I hadn't researched enough to know whether he had any younger brothers or not. <laughs> he did. 
Now, he actually now had, this, this person was was he just a prankster or was he you know an embodiment of the trickster archetype? It's hard to say. I think the major issue was that um, this is probably even before the term gatekeeping was prevalent. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. I feel like it was more of a gatekeeping. Yeah, episode. I think I think you're most definitely right there. So I can see from my newspapers dot com clippings that I must have found out that. Dr. Peoples was a real person in 2014, because it's the first time I clipped an article just out of curiosity when I was looking for something else entirely. An ad popped up for a a medical, Mm -hmm. like a medicinal preparation that Dr. Peoples had made. Mm -hmm. And I was like, could this be the same Dr. Peoples? And then I found out at that time it was. He really was a real person. Okay. Because a lot of times when people channel, they're, they're channeling. It was more in vogue, we found out, that the early 20th, part of the 20th century, to channel recently to see celebrities. and mm-hmm. But nowadays, I feel like it, it works better for people to channel someone who is not searchable. <laughs> oh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> because at this point, and even when this was probably about 20 years ago that I first became acquainted with Dr. Peoples, it would have been much harder to find out this like, sort of primary source material about him than it is now. Mm-hmm. And he's very thoroughly documented. He wrote a ton of books. He's not hard to find. He pops up in newspapers all the time. His uh, genealogy is easy to do. <laughs> <laughs> Which I'm sure you've done. Which, yeah, I, I had to because <laughs> <laughs> one of the characteristics of everyone that channels him, and it's not just one person, is that they speak with this sort of mock Scottish accent. Yeah, it's either but, Scottish or, or English. It's, well, some of them say it's Scottish, but it doesn't... If you've ever heard a Scottish person talk at any point in history, it doesn't sound like that. It doesn't sound super it's, Scottish to it's me. It's sort of like a non-specific, posh Victorian accent. It sounds to me exactly like when you hear recordings of old actors and actresses. Like just the dawn of being able to be recorded. The one you played for me today... I like, oh, that sounds like Ellen Terry. So there's a recording of the old Victorian actress, Ellen Terry, audio recording of her. The cadence, everything is exactly the same, mm-hmm. which makes me wonder, you know how you often talk about so many ghost stories are about Victorians because that's the first time we had cameras. It's the first time we knew what people looked like. It's the first time we could record sound. It's all in that era. I wonder if... They put on that voice because those early recordings are the earliest recordings we had. And that's what... Victorian people sounded Victor- like. But the thing is, that's what actors and actresses sound like. We were talking about this earlier. There was a different idea of acting back then. Now the idea is to be very natural and to be very... But this is very theatrical. Yeah, it it was very over the top and very, very pronounced and very... You put on a voice when you were acting. Mm-hmm. Sorry, opening. <laughs> 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 so that voice is a put on. Mm-hmm. Now, there are recordings of, you know, average people talking back then, and they sound a little bit different than we do today, but you can tell it's their average voice. Mm-hmm. It's not this put on. You know, they're just talking. They're talking and they're describing this and that. So my theory is that I don't think they all did it. I think whoever started doing this in recent times maybe had heard some recordings of these old-timey people from that era and decided that's what his voice should sound like. It mm-hmm. sounds very put on to me. Let's just I'll just say that. It's- yeah, and I don't know if it, if it has to sound so dramatically different from the natural speaking voice of the channeler so that you are kind of swept away into this idea that there definitely is someone else embodying them. Mm-hmm. Because it's definitely a different voice from everyone that channels it. And I have to say, they put on the same kind of voice, though. They do. And there is like a lineage where you can trace people from nearly every era past his death to the current time that have been channeling him. Before we talk about the channeling, let's talk about Dr. Peoples, So, before we get off in the weeds with all these different channelers. When was Dr. Peoples born? Well, he was born in Vermont in 1822, and very early on kind of crept towards what would be a spiritualist background. So was he Scottish? Way far back. His family's been in the United States for four or five generations, and before that, Ireland. I think where the Scottish thing comes in is that there is a... Um, 
a county, I guess, in Scotland called Peeble or town called Peebles. And in one particular article I found, he's listed as one of the famous Peebles. Okay. So I think that might be where that comes from. And maybe further back in the lineage, they are kind of Scots-Irish. I'm not sure. But there is nothing to assume that he would have... Retained an accent. Retained an accent for a country he never lived in. Yeah, yeah. If anything, he would probably just talk like a Vermonter. Right. And we did look up some Vermont accents, and they were nothing like like that. Yeah, even trying to find, like, older Vermont accents. They're they're sort of positively New England Mm -hmm. and not... Scottish in nature. Yes. How long did Dr. Peebles live? How long was he around? He lived for just shy of 100 years. His birthday was going to be the next month when he died, and he was going to be 100 years old. And he had written years previously a book on how to live to be 100. So what he also had going for him is both of his parents lived to be almost 100. Mm -hmm. That does tend to be the nature of longevity. Yeah. They called him Methuselah at one point. <laughs> but he also did a lot of things to um, to better himself as, from a sort of a, a health standpoint. He was very progressive, as um, the spiritualist movement is. And um, the thing I love about the spiritualist movement is that so often it's tied into progressive politics in general, anti-slavery. Those movements kind of grew up in tandem. And so there's a lot of crossover between vegetarianism, anti-slavery, spiritualism, And actually photography. (laughs) Oh, interesting. He was also anti-vivisection, and he wrote a whole book about, I don't want to get this, so that was demonetized by saying this, but he wrote a treatise about his concerns over vaccination. Mm. We'll put it that way. This has nothing to do with that. This is just background information. Right, yeah, yeah. We're not going down that road. Yeah, we're not going down that road. Mentioning that he did. (laughs) Yeah, (laughs) he went down that road, and you can read about it online because all of it's available. Also among his anti-slavery... And vegetarian stance was also a peace component. So this is from 1905, where he talked at the Shakers Peace Conference. And I'm th- they're talking about the Shakers being the uh, religious order, the Shakers, correct? Mm-hmm. Delegates advocate universal arbitration and disarmament. The peace conference called by the Shakers was held here in Mount Lebanon, New York. The principal speakers who are not members of the society included Walter S. Logan, ex-president of the New York Bar Association, William Barnes, Sr. of Albany, Professor John L. N. Hunt, ex-president of the New York City Board of Education, and Dr. James M. Peoples of Battle Creek, Reverend Henry S. Club, president of the National Vegetarian Society, Rabbi Charles Fleischer, Reverend Amanda Dayo, vice president of the Universal Peace Union, and Mrs. Elizabeth Granis. All the speakers advocated the arbitration of international disputes, the reduction of armaments both on land and sea, with a consequent reduction of the burden of taxation, and the establishment of the great waterways of commerce as neutral zones. President Roosevelt's intention in the Russo-Japanese dispute was highly praised. What year is that? This is 1905, so he's quite old at this time. Mm -hmm. Still talking about peace and justice issues. He did not know what was right around the corner. No, he did not. He moved around a lot, as I think a lot of spiritualist people did. Mm -hmm. In the process, he also attained a lot of medical degrees. He um, was the owner of the Atlantic Mirror, a magazine from New Jersey when he lived there. He lived in Baltimore. He lived in Battle Creek, Michigan. He traveled around the world five different times. And um, while that's something that's repeated often in his bio, I, I had to check that for myself. And I found ads going to from the 1870s from him lecturing in Australia. Oh, wow. So he really was quite the world traveler, just an, an unusual person for the time and shared the stage with a lot of anti-slavery people and abolitionists in general, and came to live for a majority of his life in, I'd say beyond Vermont, his his home base would be Battle Creek, Michigan, which is where Sojourner Truth lived. So all these things kind of grew up in tandem. Mm-hmm. So these are the parts of spiritualism that I really like. It really was sort of the religion of people who had more forward-thinking mm-hmm. values at the time. Like anything, it can go off the rails and and go in other directions, and I think in some cases it does, and this might be one of them. <laughs> <laughs> there were some controversies surrounding him? Yeah, well, I told you about all the different medical degrees he had. Mm-hmm. Some of them were just kind of diploma mills. Hey, 
You got to get a degree somehow, right? <laughs> Expensive. He uh, was a, a member of the, what is it, the National Medical Association? Mm -hmm. But that might have been based on one of his medical degrees he received. And he received so many degrees. It was nearly impossible for one person to have attained these. And, and the medical degree he obtained, he would have been in his 50s at the time that he got it. Mm -hmm. Which is an unusual thing as someone's traveling to be able to just somehow commit the time to get a medical degree. <laughs> Are you casting doubt on my new medical degree? <laughs> is it come from the same place as your uh, ability to marry people? <laughs> <laughs> the university of whatever.com. <laughs> the, the university of I looked it up on the internet. It was enough for several friends of ours who've gotten married though. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And you yet, look the part, though. You look like some sort of official clergy member. I am out of the business of marrying people. Yeah, so. It's too stressful. Yeah. I enjoy doing it when it's over and that people are happy, and I enjoy taking place in that happy day in people's lives, but it is so pressure-filled. Well, it's their special day. Exactly. Everybody— You, you can't know, mess up somebody's special day. Well, and I wanted to make it nice for them, and mm -hmm. then it just— Somebody would always have something to say. Oh, the guy with the long hair? It was He's too with... short. It was too long. It was too this. It was too that. <laughs> Why'd you do this? Why'd you do that? And most often it wasn't the bride or the groom who had those things to say. It was the people yeah, in their family. the extra people. And it became so stressful that the, the last one I did was a friend of ours' daughter. And it went really well. And she was super sweet. As she always, I mean, the girl was born sweet, right? Mm -hmm. Like she's just a sweetheart of a person. But it was no pressure. She was super sweet. I was still super nervous because I want to do a good job. Mm -hmm. But they were super thankful and just it just went perfectly. And I thought, that's it. End on a high note. Yeah. Let's get out of here. I'm done. <laughs> that, that one went great. So, so yeah, no, I no, I no longer do that. <laughs> so don't ask. I bet Dr. Peoples would have you asked. He would probably, someone could channel him and he could give the whole thing. I'm yeah. sure he could. For the right price. <laughs> exactly. So uh, at one point in the late 1890s, he decides to set up the People's Institute of Health. That's based out of Battle Creek, Michigan. It's an institute that is mail order only. I'm getting a Dr. Crandall vibe here. It's very similar to Dr. Crandall. And he starts, this is where like the pamphlets and the remedies start to pop up. So I'm going to read you just a little bit from an ad this is actually, for a brief time, he was in Altoona, Pennsylvania, okay. because why not? Yeah, why not? Beautiful Altoona. And this is a little ad that has a, a lithograph of him, and it's entitled Dr. Peebles as a Specialist. Dr. Peebles, a graduate of the Philadelphia University of Medicine and Surgery and registered in the city of Philadelphia as a practicing physician and member of the National Medical Association, was for a time connected with the City University Hospital. He is also proprietor of and physician to the noted Harmonium Sanitarium near Philadelphia. And he treats such chronic complaints as catarrh, consumption, dyspepsia, rheumatism, heart disease, liver complaint, constipation, neuralgia, skin disease, epilepsy, kidney difficulties, nervous troubles, deafness, straightens crooked eyes, treats fibroid and ovarian tumors, etc. Patients that he considers incurable, he frankly, kindly so informs them. <laughs> Ladies will receive a special attention. <laughs> I guess so. Gentlemen suffering from difficulties peculiar to themselves will be guaranteed prompt relief, and knowing that conscientious persons are often imposed upon by impostors and unprincipled pretenders without a medical education, charging heavily in advance, Dr. Peebles has adopted the plan of charging nothing for advice, consultation, or treatment until the patient is well. Nothing except for the medicines used during the course of the treatment. You want to guess who sold the medicines? <laughs> I'm guessing it was him. Yes. And Dr. Peebles was well known for his epilepsy remedy. I'm going to tell you what was in his epilepsy remedy. Or do you want to guess first? Alcohol. Alcohol is always a major component of it, but not the most major in this one. It was 22% ammonia. Ammonia? Yeah. What does that do to a person? I don't know, but whatever that does to a person can be balanced out by the 8.4% of alcohol, potassium, bromide, and chloride. It's actually a lot of things that are in photographic chemicals. chemicals. <laughs> and there, I did actually read that at the time period they were thinking that, that bromides were actually helpful for epilepsy. But, yeah, it's not in this particular form, and this was 
absolutely a quack medicine. Ammonia. That seems not good. That does seem not good. Wow. Okay. And not tasty. No. no. I, it doesn't mention anything about like some fun herbs that would have been in it or anything. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So he does not have an unblemished record. I would imagine not. This is from 1902 when he's officially convicted of fraud. Whenever they put something in quotes, you know that they don't really mean it. (laughs) So this says, People's Institute of Health, in quotes, overhauled in Detroit case. Doctors James M. Peoples and Walter T. Bobo and Chaz M. Green of the People's Institute of Health, Battle Creek, Michigan, were convicted by a jury in the United States District Court here today of violating the postal laws. A 30-day stay of proceedings will prevent immediate sentence. It was charged that advertisements of their mental cure by mail for many sorts of ills constituted an attempt to obtain money by fraud. At the trial, Dr. Bobo testified that he believed Dr. Peebles had a healing power like that of Jesus, except that the doctor's power was smaller. Dr. Bobo admitted that even if a patient at a distance managed to procure Dr. Peebles' signed instructions and followed them faithfully, the cure would not be effective if the patient had not paid the fee of one dollar. <laughs> <laughs> Apparently that is... The $1 fee is how the healing happens. Interesting. I kind of want to find out what happened to Dr. Bobo now. You know what? I read it. He went on to be a, a, a big wig in the Battle Creek, Michigan area. He was part of a group of people who made the golf course there. I think he did fine. People land on their feet, isn't it? Like rich people land on their feet. <laughs> I'm laughing because your research is so, it's so you. Because it was like, I would not have looked into Dr. Bobo. I'd have just been like, nope, this is about Dr. Yeah, Peebles. Like, I got to find We kind of do like a... a like a brief outline and then hope that we can kind of Mm -hmm. like use those talking points to kind of mutter our way through things. But you didn't ask me that before. No, I didn't ask you that before. (laughs) But like if I was researching that, I'd have been like, oh, Bobo, that's a funny name. (laughs) And then that would have been the end of it. No, you go dead. Like wonder what happened to Dr. Bobo. Are there any photos of Dr. Bobo? Who's Dr. Bobo related to? Am I related to Dr. Bobo? Let me check. You are not related. (laughs) There's an envelope here. It's like Maury Povich. You are not related to Dr. Bobo. (laughs) Are you sure? It's a great name, though, right? <laughs> Battle Creek, Michigan, really kind of accepted Dr. Peebles as one of its more famous eccentric people. And in the 70s, we're doing a review of people that were... He wasn't the only quack medicine person from Battle Creek. But they have a little excerpt here of what happened at the trial, which I think is really interesting. Okay. And w- since this is from the 70s, what paper does this come from? This is from the Battle Creek Inquirer, Sunday, December 5th, 1976. Okay. I will never forget, recalled Bingay, he was a a columnist for the uh, Detroit Free Press at the time, when District Attorney Gordon bellowed at Dr. Peoples on the stand, do you believe this jury of God-fearing men now claim under oath that you have the powers of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ to heal the sick and restore the dead to life? Peoples rose from the chair to his full height of six feet four and raised his fist high above his head. He looked like Moses in a Cecil B. DeMille super colossal. I do, he cried in a rich baritone voice that reverberated through the old court chambers. I do, and may God strike me dead on the spot if I am not possessed of such power. He gave it to me. Speak, O God, and give this jury proof. Proof! And for about a minute he stood there and then relaxed. He turned to the jury in a soft purring voice and said, Gentlemen, you see for yourselves. (laughs) But they had too much on the old boy. There was too long a parade of pitiful victims who paid out hundreds of dollars just to gaze into a glass of magic water and to concentrate on him to cure cancer or tuberculosis. When a local reporter asked him how he was so robust in his advanced age, Peebles responded, I behave myself. I eat no pork, pickles, pepper, drink no liquor, no tea, no coffee, use no tobacco, and obey nature's laws. So he continues, as a lot of hucksters do, lands on his feet, mm-hmm. even as old as he is after this. And this happens in the early 1900s. He still lives till 1922. He moves to Los Angeles and becomes some somewhat of a celebrity and is involved heavily in different spiritualist churches there. And two women are... Um, His good friends who take care of him in their old age, they will return soon after his death. Interesting. So he's determined to make it to his 100th birthday. Well, he wrote the book. Yeah, he wrote the book. He he would make him a liar if he didn't make it to 100. He he wouldn't want to be dishonest. (laughs) (laughs) Here is an article from August the 8th, 1821. Psychist is dying. 
no hope held out for the recovery of Dr. James Martin Peoples. 1921, you meant. What did I say? You said 1821. I meant 1921. 1921, okay. Yeah, because that would have been a year before he was born. That mm-hmm. doesn't make any sense. <laughs> <laughs> the condition of Dr. James M. Peoples, 3409 South Hope Street, which is now current. I looked it up. I wanted to see where he lived. It's a uh, parking garage on the USC campus. Okay. Wah, wah. <laughs> 99-year-old physician and psychologist who is believed to be dying of dropsy and heart disease remained virtually unchanged yesterday. Dr. N. McFarlane, who has been constantly at his bedside since two weeks ago when his condition became critical, holds out but little hope for his recovery and says that death is probably not many days away from the scientist, explorer, publisher, and lecturer. His strength, rallying slightly from time to time, seems to be gradually flowing away. Dr. Peoples, in addition to having been consul to Trebizende, Turkey, and having five times gone around the world, founded the Centenarian Club and the People's College of Science and Philosophy, and has a wide reputation as an authority on spiritualism. But he persisted. (laughs) He didn't die within days. How much longer did he live? Well, he's getting pretty close to his 100th birthday. His birthday is March 23rd. But now we're in February, 1922. And he dies on the 15th. This is an article entitled, White Coffin is Specified. Dr. Peebles, in his will, asks for his ashes to be strewn about the trees and roses. The will of Dr. James M. Peebles, spiritualist leader, which was admitted into probate yesterday, specified that his body be placed in a white coffin, later cremated, and the ashes strewn about trees and rose bushes. Dr. Peoples died here Wednesday at the age of nearly 100. The funeral will be held today. The will also provided for a division of the estate between the California Spiritualist Association. Relatives and friends, Reverend C.C. Pierce was named as executor, the value of the estate not given. So he almost made it. Yep, he almost made it. I saw one of the modern people's, one of the modern people that channel him. Mm-hmm. I don't know if it was in one of their books or not. There's a lot of books and stuff. But I saw one of the things that he was 99.9 years old mm-hmm. when he died. Not quite. Oh, you mean doing the math correctly? Yeah. <laughs> it's close. Yeah, it's like 11 twelfths, right, or something. <laughs> So you would think normally when someone dies, the story would end right there, right? That, that's kind of the end. This is strange familiars, though. It's still going on. <laughs> Being that it's 2023, we can officially say that his afterlife has now been longer than his terrestrial life. Oh, yeah. yeah. He is perhaps more alive today than he was in his time because a lot of people are his mouthpiece. According to one website, I saw at least 25 people in just North America. Currently. Currently. Currently channel. But there are a lot of major people. Mm -hmm. Well, who was the first person or people to channel? Well, it happened pretty soon after he died. Almost immediately. Okay. (laughs) And so did the fighting over who was his mouthpiece. Mm, Interesting. So the two people that were with him towards the end that he was very good friends with, who he promised that he would give a message to if he made it to the other side, were Minnie Sayers, who was the founder of the Spiritualist Church of the Revelation, and her husband was Dr. W.Q. Sayers, who was a magnetic healer. They were both in the Spiritualist movement. And then Susie McFarlane, who I presume was the wife of N. McFarlane, who was the doctor who had been taking care of him. Mm. I think the Insane Clown Posse are magnetic healers, too. Now, yeah, I think so. Yeah. I mean, there is some magic in it. <laughs> <laughs> So they are anxiously awaiting a response for him Mm -hmm. and are quite surprised when it comes from an entirely different source. Surprise might not even be the right answer. Perturbed, perhaps. Ah, (laughs) Because it wasn't them? It wasn't them. So some of the first things that come through are that Dr. Peebles promises to be at his banquet for his birthday. Mm -hmm. Okay, and this is an article called Promises He'll Be at Earth Banquet. 
There are newspapers in heaven, or Summerland, as the astral realm is called by its inhabitants, according to messages reported to have been received from Dr. James Martin Peoples, the noted spiritualist, who has promised to return to his friends at a banquet tonight in a Broadway restaurant. The banquet is being held at 648 South Broadway tonight on the anniversary of Dr. Peoples' 100th birthday. It is given under the auspices of the Longer Life League, of which Dr. Guy Bogart is executive secretary. What a great name. Mm -hmm. It's almost like Guy Incognito. (laughs) Some of Dr. Peoples' friends are positive they will see a materialization of the noted savant at the banquet, where the chair of honor is reserved for him. Others say he may be there in spirit, but remain invisible to the guests. Dr. Peoples is credited with sending many messages to friends on Earth since his departure to the other side, but because of his recent advent in Summerland, he has yet not mastered the means of communication directly. The accompanying picture shows what purports to be the first message received from Dr. Peoples in his own handwriting. The other messages were sent through Herman Keene, his friend in the astral land. In the latest message, Dr. Peoples seems to express pleasure at his reception in Summerland. He writes that he is hailed by the spiritualistic thinkers and the astral press as the dean, the pioneer, the spiritual pilgrim, the world's missionary, and the venerable patriarch of modern spiritualism. The communication was obtained with what was said to be the aid of Herman Keen, through a medium whom Dr. Peoples highly esteemed when on Earth. The medium reported Keen said Dr. Peoples would communicate with the Earth exclusively through him until able to speak directly. The handwriting is said of friends of the dead to be an exact likeness of his own. This is an article written by Herman Keen, who's dead, reporting from Astroland, He's a special correspondent. <laughs> from, from the astral land. Yeah. Special correspondent for the record in astral land. Summerland, March 23rd, Earthly Time. I'm always glad to act as an intermediary for Dr. James M. Peoples. He says the climate of heaven resembles very much that of Southern California, <laughs> as it's pictured by the Chamber of Commerce. He liked Los Angeles, but says to tell folks that they have better transportation service where he is now than you do down there. This is still Herman speaking, but I shall paraphrase his statements and put them down as if they were speaking directly to you. This he will not do much for a time. No matter how far advanced a man may be on earth in matters spiritual, there are still things to be learned of importance in the technique of communication. Now I'll give you the doctor's message. It all seemed queer to me when I came over here, in spite of 65 years of belief in the spirit world and my knowledge of many of its great laws. Man does not jump suddenly from one state of vibration to another, but carries into the astral, the mental, and emotional vibrations, which were strong in the last period of the flesh. You are aware of my long sickness before the passing across, and when I awoke here I found myself surrounded by nurses, sitting in a chair and warmly covered with blankets. Now a spirit doesn't need blankets and warmth, but I had carried it over enough of the earth vibrations to feel this need for a time, so then the nurses were provided to bridge over the change. A friend visited him in her finer body. Mrs. Ida Lewis Bentley, who I loved most dearly, came to me in her finer body, as she terms it, while I was convalescing, and she told you of this yesterday when you visited her in Hollywood. Her story is correct. On the strong combined vibrations of Mrs. Bentley and yourself, I was able to come for, I dearly love both of you for the years of association in the flesh. The blanket I loved and lost on earth was here for me. Interesting that Herman Cain was... Oh. Herman K. <laughs> well, it's I think it's it's K U E H N, which I think is like is Keen and not Coon. Probably Kern, maybe I don't. Yeah, it could be. Yeah. Keen, Keeny. Should have never spelled it. No one would have ever known. I know, and now yeah. they're be like, "Well, that's my name," and now you said it incorrectly. No one's going to check you. I'm just glad that Jeremy Renner became popular because for years and years, our last name was Reiner to everyone that ever called us. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> thank you, Jeremy Renner, yeah. for your service. Yeah, and let's weird. thank the Avengers, please. Yes, please, please thank the Avengers. Yeah. Okay, and then this is another little part in the same article which talks about Dr. Guy Bogart, who is the one who is actually the one still alive who's manifesting all this because Herman's dead and so is Dr. Peoples. So he claims that he isn't a channeler. Dr. Bogart. Yeah. Okay. Yet he's the one channeling all this. Okay. Was this the guy he was with before? Like the guy in in Michigan? No, that no. was Dr. Bobo. Okay. Sorry. <laughs> this is Bogart. That was Bobo. Oh, silly me. 
There was a notable absence of ghostly phenomenon about the reception by Dr. Guy Bogart of what purported to be an interview with Dr. James Martin Peoples conducted in the astral world by Herman Keene. Dr. Bogart was seated in his office, headquarters of the Longer Life League. I was nearby, and a stenographer was present. The light streamed brightly through a window, and from below came the rumble of Broadway. The awesomeness of black cabinets and circles of devotees holding hands in the darkness was altogether lacking. There's no real barrier between the two spheres, exclaimed Dr. Bogart, who for years had been studying psychic phenomenon. All we need to do is remember that in reality time and space do not exist, and then try to put ourselves in rapport with those with whom we wish to communicate, be they living or dead. I'm not a trans medium, he explained. All my communications with residents of the astral planes are telepathic, the same as I communicate with my wife when one of us is in one room and the other in another. Everybody's familiar with telepathy of that sort. I had already explained to Dr. Bogart that the record was ready to pioneer in this strange field and had asked him to communicate to Herman Keene, who had been a newspaper man on Earth, a request that he act as special correspondent for the paper on the other side. And this request was made without any intention of committing the record to a policy of exploiting so-called spiritualistic communications as being worthy of credence. It was simply desired to explore a new realm, if such exist, and publish what communications were received for what the reader thinks they are. So, so was this a series? Did they have a series of, of letters from the other side or articles from the other side? Well, Dr. Bogart continues to have some messages, which causes a problem. So this is what happens the night of the party. Okay. There is no death, says spirit. And I wonder if, I don't know so much about modern spiritualism as it takes the form of sort of new age theology, mm-hmm. but they refer quite often to Dr. Peoples as spirit. Mm -hmm. And this says, there is no death, says spirit. Mm. And I don't know if if that comes from just taking the fact that he is a spirit into being the one spirit. Yeah, I'm not sure. Why don't you channel some of them or just call them on the phone and we'll find out. (laughs) Friends of Dr. Peoples declare his, his wraith came back for his centennial banquet at Los Angeles. Dr. James Martin Peoples, physician and scientist, dead since February 15th, not only attended in the spirit a banquet to celebrate his centennial, but has sent back from beyond at least one message. Guests assembled to honor his memory last night. Dr. Bogart, head of the Longer Life League, stood beside an empty chair at the banquet and announced Dr. Peoples is with us, sitting in his chair. Later, Dr. Bogart wrote a message. He stated he had received from Dr. Peoples since the latter's death through the late Herman King, publisher of... Chicago. He explained, because of Dr. Peoples' short life beyond, he was unable to communicate directly. A word to Dr. Bogart and the Longer Life League friends, the message said, I know in my innermost vision that I would celebrate my centennial beyond the gates, but that I would be with the Longer Life League in the spirit as well. It made little difference to me on which side of the gate I made the celebration. Guy recalls that I told him a couple of years ago that I was anxious to explore the moon and go journeying among the stars. Well, I'm getting my wishes gratified, and the old rheumatism is a thing of the past. Isn't that helpful to know? In the service of love, you will find your excuse for living. It will make your life full and overflowing. Watch the physical side, the diet and exercise to lengthen the years. It is a crime to die under a hundred. This one word I am glad to add to my testimony to the fact that there is no death. Dr. Peoples, before his death, told friends he intended to attempt to communicate with him, as he had been deeply interested in various forms of psychic research. The program included a speech by Dr. George Morrison, who will be 102 on June 4th. A memorial service for Dr. Peoples was held last night. During the day, his ashes were scattered according to a request in his will over a rose garden, the location of which was kept a secret. So as I suggested before, not all of this went over well. Amongst all of his friends. Not everybody was believing that that was a real message. Okay. Because they wanted to be the first to deliver the message? I think so. Yeah. And because they were promised. hmm This article from March 30th, a week later, is entitled, Dead Spiritualist Starts Controversy. Ooh. Scientists grow interested in claim of aged man to speak to friends. Has Dr. James Martin Peoples, dead spiritualist, kept the promise he made during life and spoken to his friends in the world of the living from the shadowy land beyond the grave? Yes, asserts Dr. Guy Bogart, who says he received a message from Dr. Peoples on his 100th birthday. 
No, says Mrs. Susie McFarland Page, close friend of Dr. Peebles, and Mrs. Minnie M. Sayers, non-professional medium and pastor of the Spiritualist Church of the Revelation. I believe she's made, she's referred to as a non-professional medium because this was a time when they were cracking down on fortune tellers, and if you were part of a spiritualist church, you were in a, under um, different auspices than gotcha. just being a fortune teller. Gotcha. Peoples promised the two women while still living that he would come back to them after death, but they say he has not yet been able to return. A controversy has sprung up between Dr. Bogart and the women that has aroused psychics and mystics of the Pacific Coast and the whole nation. Before his death, Peoples promised Mrs. Page, who cared for him in his declining years, that he would manifest himself to her after his death, and he made the same pledge to Mrs. Sayers, his lifelong friend, whose church he attended. Mrs. Sayers says she was in communication with Dr. Peoples on March 19th. He was lying on a bed of roses, and she said, Tell Mrs. Page I'm trying. I'm trying. Peoples said according to Mrs. Sayers, and then faded from view. Peoples is not yet strong enough to make himself manifest to the material world. She says the departed scholar is in relatively the same condition as a newborn child, unable to express himself till he matures as a spirit, and so the controversy goes on. Part of this, I presume, is because there is some recognition that there's still like some residual cash to be made here. Yeah, I would imagine so. He also starts to write on Slate and appears in a photo of another spiritualist who dies that very same month. That's interesting. So Harry Houdini, as I think we talked about, we had a, I we mean, did a show. On we Houdini. did a whole show about Houdini and debunking spiritualism. Mm -hmm. There was another famous spiritualist who died roughly the same time as Doctor Peoples, and she had asserted that upon her death, they would be able to see her apparition or other spirits around her if someone would take a picture during her during her funeral, which mm -hmm. they did. And they put a big black board, I don't know if it was a slate up or whatever, and when the picture was developed, there were three spirits on it. One was her father, one was a friend, and one was said to be Dr. Peoples, and it was one of the only photos that Houdini said he was perplexed by. He didn't mm. absolutely categorically deny it as being real. If you look at it now, you go, uh. Have you, so you've seen this photo? <laughs> yeah, it's very oh. cuttingly fairy kind of quality. Oh, okay. It's, All right. It, it, it might have been tricky maybe back then, but now you're looking and you go, I don't think that's a spirit, but, you know, I haven't seen that many. Who am I to say? That many spirits or that many? You've seen plenty of photos. And I've seen a lot of spirit photos, but I've not seen any spirits. Mm. So maybe I'm not the one to answer this. Flannel man accepting. Don't you start. He continues to write messages. People start to arrive to hear him talk. Which channeler are we talking about now? Dr. Peoples himself is, 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 is popping up different places. Oh, okay. So these are different people channeling him? Mm hmm Okay. Dr. Edward Earle and, Doc, and Mr. W.J. Waterhouse have slate writings of Dr. Peoples. And Dr. Peoples talks to them about how he's very busy greeting old friends. He's a little too busy to write. <laughs> uh, but he does write in automatic writing through them on a slate. To my beloved friends, I come... As agreed to testify that I found a great and wonderful life where I awoke, I shall always be ready to greet you March 23rd in memory of my hundred years. I hereby extend my sincere thanks to all who were so kind and patient with me. Signed, Dr. James Martin Peoples. But I think what's more fascinating is that he continues to be channeled. So I started to go decade by decade and looking for like channels, Dr. Peoples. And I didn't find too much in the 1930s. And the only thing I can conclude from that is that, one, it's the Depression, and people don't have a lot of extra money to be giving to fortune tellers at that point in time, so they're falling out of favor a bit. Mm -hmm. Secondly, that would probably add to why people aren't advertising as much. Even preachers uh, or, or any kind of mediums probably just didn't have the money to advertise. Yeah, yeah. That doesn't mean that there wasn't somebody actively doing it. 1940s, it's the war. While there's, you know, during every war, there's sort of a revival of spiritualist thought to some degree. That's quickly kind of flushed away in the late 40s. But in the 1950s, I did find uh, Reverend John W. Bunker in Lansing, Michigan, has started doing readings where he channels Dr. Peoples. And he has one of the sort of probably typical sad stories about how someone becomes interested in spiritualism. He and his wife had a child who died unexpectedly. Mm -hmm. And while searching for solace, came upon the spiritualist church and was convinced of its ability to show him that his child was 
able to communicate with him and he became a, a very fervent believer. It doesn't really say, I mean, I can't really glean too much from the, the ads why he chose Dr. Peoples to channel, but he was one of the earlier people in the 20th century you, to do. You wonder if there's like, was there some form of unbroken line? Kind of like magicians where the, you're like, like passing on. yeah. The like, torch. I mean, I think because he he was uh, such a prolific spiritualist writer, mm -hmm. like you can't really say like that you're going to be Blavatsky or something like that. People will call you on it, right? I mean, uh, I don't. Sure I mean, people have. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Maybe that was a poor example, but um, there were plenty of mediums at the time. At the end of this podcast, by the way, I, I will be channeling Patterson, the famous Patterson of Patterson Gimlin. Oh, I thought you were going to channel Patty. <laughs> <laughs> which sounds funnier uh yeah the, the scratch that at the end of this podcast i will be channeling patty from uh, the uh -huh. patter skimlin film yes that's better yeah. Yeah, yeah it would be fun i have a lot of funny voices i could do for that. <laughs> so you would think the 60s would be a big time where i would find people but it's really not till kind of the end of the 60s that i find this sort of next wave of people who inform all of the people that are currently practicing okay the Reverend William Raynan and Thomas Jacobson are kind of the next people to start channeling. And you can go online and hear both of them. Are they related to each other? Or are these two separate people that are doing it? Uh, they're two separate people. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Raynan's first, and then Thomas Jacobson learns from him in the 70s. And at first, Jacobson does not want to channel because he knows that that's Raynan's thing, but then he feels compelled to because Dr. Peoples speaks to him and tells him that he can be a mouthpiece for him as well. He's so influential that people write books about him. Uh, there's a famous book by Don and Linda Pendleton about Thomas Jacobson and his channeling of Dr. Peebles. That you can buy. Like, lots of people are totally and completely enamored with Dr. Peebles and the people who channel him. Yeah, I, I looked up just on Amazon. There's several books and... The reviews are, I don't know that these are just the author's friends, but the, yeah, of course fairly they are. glowing for, th for these. Yeah, and in all the comments, people are, I mean, the message that he gives, which is repeated through many channelers, it, you know, they're, they're messages that are vague enough and positive enough that I don't know why it, probably everyone would have some, they're easily digestible it's, messages of, you know. It's the cold reading thing, right? So the idea of the cold reading for psychics is, first of all, you... You learn people, and you learn their reactions. You learn their expressions. And there's lots to presuppose by the fact that someone's there to begin with. Sure. But there are things that you can start out with. You can, you can just generally tell people that uh, they're empathetic, and everybody's like, oh, yeah, that's me. I'm empathetic. You tell people they're leaders or they're misunderstood. You know, you really feel like people just don't get you. They don't get the true you. And, the, you know, people are like, yeah, that's me. Yeah, you know? no one understands yeah, me. Yeah, and, and you just do this cold. And then you start with, like, have you lost someone recently? You know, Which, you, if you're coming to see a spiritualist, you probably... You just open that with that question. If they say yes, and you know, and you just narrow it down. It's a process of narrowing down. It's sort of telling people what they want to hear and narrowing things down as you do it. And I think there's a lot of that in this channeling stuff, too. It's it's very similar. And I, I mean, I'm open enough to say that maybe there are some people within this realm who are legitimate. Mm -hmm. Really? <laughs> um, I think, okay, I'll put it this way. No, I don't really think that. I, but I do think that there are some people who legitimately feel that they are okay. channeling. I'm willing to give. I'm willing to give that. Yeah. So that not everybody is out there deliberately to be a shyster. Yeah. The, the voices bother me. I don't know who was the first to come up with what what is the sort of cliche Doctor Peebles voice. And if you go online, you can hear any number of these people do it, and it's virtually identical. It's one aping the other one. Yeah. The, the cadence and the the delivery is. And there's certain things that he says. Over and over again, particularly in there are two modern people that channel him, Summer Bacon and Natalie Gianelli, who they both repeat certain phrases over and over again. We were talking about this in relation to mind control techniques and mm -hmm. hypnosis, where you're repeating certain phrases over and over again. And then he has this very like 
almost ASMR quality lilting voice. Mm -hmm. And it's very kind of hypnotic. It's interesting that you say he has, not, well, not uh, they're using. Well, it's Dr. Peebles, not them, right? <laughs> <laughs> is this, Al are, are you here, Allison? <laughs> like, is that Allison over there? <laughs> well, I'm channeling a different Allison tonight. <laughs> One who's trying to be respectful of things that I don't believe in. Well, that's that's good. That is good. I uh, don't, I mean. So it, th these with these modern people, is there sort of controversy between them and challenges as to who is channeling the real Dr. Peebles? Or did they live peacefully with each other? Well, I'll say this. On each individual web page is sort of like when you're trying to gatekeep something and you talk about like, well, I met so-and-so in 1982. Well, I met so-and-so in 1971. And, mm -hmm. and mine is the true lineage learned from such and such. You know, like they're subtle digs, but the digs are there. Kind mm -hmm. of thing. But I, they don't outright claim like anybody else channeling Dr. Peebles is channeling his trickster younger brother and is therefore false and you can't trust them. No, but there are in some of the frequently asked questions on the websites, like, is it okay to channel Dr. Peebles? And sometimes the answers are things like, well, you don't really know who you're channeling and it takes a long time to learn how to do this. And So there, uh, that would be my question right back to them. How do you know who you're channeling? Wow, they have the voice. <laughs> <laughs> I think this is very much like our last patron ship where we talked about the CE5 thing. Mm -hmm. There may be something of value in what they're doing, but their definitions may not apply. I think that's fair. Yeah. I mean, they, like I, we were talking like, is it okay to take a message from someone who is a fraud if the message is positive? Mm-hmm. It's kind of like, is it okay to listen to music by problematic artists? Or, <laughs> Yeah. I, you know, if you are channeling your inner self, mm -hmm. is that any less fantastic than channeling a dead spirit? The only thing I will say that the difference comes in in that you are paying to talk to a spirit. That is what they're purporting. Yeah. You're not paying to listen to any of these people's opinions. Right, but you know, let's let's, let's take the, the paycheck out of it. And let's just say you're disconnecting from yourself, from your conscious mind, and you're bringing through messages from somewhere else, mm -hmm. right? Does it become any less amazing if you're not talking to some disembodied dead spirit, but if you're pulling from your own subconscious? I don't know. I, and, and I think I'm always going to be mired in the fact that if someone's trying to trick you, that that just colors everything. How can you receive a message of truth from a false person? Yeah. There's the Allison. I was, I, <laughs> she's back. Allison's back. She's here. Well, when they do these channels, it's like they go into these really dramatic, like, like all of a sudden it's like as if like the wind was either coming out of them or blowing into them and then all of a sudden they wake up out of this trance and then they have to pretend like oh like, like they don't know where happened? they are where yeah. am what? i oh what? was i out for two hours <laughs> yeah. i have no idea yeah. <laughs> that I Ooh, uh, oh yeah. Whoa, where and am the thing I? is it's like like come on we've seen you do this 17 times yes <laughs> there's multiple modern people that channel him mm -hmm. yeah. how many roughly well the one website said that there were like 25 people and it seemed like everybody that ever heard a message also decided they were going to channel him too <laughs> i've kind of feel bad for your friend because it seems like she was shot down and then there's all these other people channeling him anyway yeah i did yeah like why is her message any more yeah why? or less valid and the only thing i can say is that you can uh, with this particular person channeler that she learned from you can also get a hundred and fifty dollar or a picture taken with you and Dr. Peoples. Mm. You can get private sessions with Dr. Peoples. People live off of Dr. Peoples. Yeah, can very, can I get a, a degree of any any kind? Is there is there a diploma of any sort that I can get? For enough money, I'm sure there is. <laughs> I would invite you to go onto YouTube and watch the individual people. Yeah, it's um, um Unfortunately we can't play any of them. Yeah embodying like, dr peoples yeah, we probably could as a matter of like fair use but let's not push that because yeah if you want to hear a, a male perspective of someone doing it thomas jacobson there are recordings of him 
Athena Demetrios, Summer Bacon, Natalie Gianelli, Kimberly Domain. These are all people who are currently channeling Dr. Peoples. And um, there are many books written about him, people's experiences through other people. And when all these people are being interviewed in trance state, other people are just utterly captivated by what they have to say. They give continuing lectures, series of lectures, messages, daily messages. And of people I know were completely taken with these messages. Mm-hmm. They're, I mean, they're hope-filled. The basic tenets were like belief in yourself. Light and love. Light and love. You know, yeah. all the stuff that makes up the good parts about yeah. any spiritual thought. Mm-hmm. And so I wasn't trying to... Um, make fun of them for their interest in him. I just think, does it not say something about the channeler that they choose someone who was a fraud in their <laughs> terrestrial life? Yeah. To be like that. And it's almost like when all these people are doing it, it's almost like couldn't get any more creative. You couldn't find another spiritualist to channel. I know. Why not be a fox sister or something? Yeah, right. Yeah. While we were, you know, kind of discussing the outline and so forth of this, I stumbled onto another channeler. I'm not going to say his name because it's, uh, it's that's not the point of this. But this person was a man and claimed to channel several people, male and female. Very all of them famous. All of them were famous. And this is the early 20th century, right? The early early well, 1900s, or uh, this is the he died, I think, in the 70s or something. So, or maybe even a little later. But these, there's recordings of him doing this in the 60s, like at the dawn of the home tape recorder. You know, it's another time, and people just. He's a British guy, and one of the people he chose to channel, or maybe he didn't choose, maybe this just the came The channel through, cho- chose him. Was an African-American woman from the South. Oh, it's not good. Who was a, who was an ex-slave. And... Well, that's unfortunate. Yeah. This particular guy claims that he's not even doing the voices. He, there's no video of him, but that like he had his mouth taped shut, and these are just voices just happen around him, right? It's that's very a, that's a harder sell. It's very obviously you're doing a ventriloquist thing at the same time. Very obviously a man doing a quote unquote woman's voice. It's very obviously a British person trying to do a Southern accent. Oh yeah, and it's so racist. It's awful. It's awful. It's one of those things where you just listen to with your it's just your mouth open, just like. This happened. There's, like he didn't have any clue that this wasn't cool. Like there was like I know it was a different time. Nothing dawned on him. Like <laughs> maybe not. You know maybe don't do this. If wow. You're already pretending to be someone else, speaking for someone from the dead. Is the leap that you know? Oh, this was not good. This was not good. So you know. Is he the one that also claimed to do Oscar Wilde too? Yeah. Yeah. Ellen Terry, Oscar Wilde, mm-hmm. and and it's funny. There's like people that would have been probably popular when he was much younger yeah I mean, and, and would have been totally out of fashion and probably not yeah. well known at the time yeah i i don't know he was very problematic all right so uh you want to channel dr peoples and sign it off well he did send a message to me did he yeah and it's written on the slate here mm-hmm. and it says you're a knucklehead <laughs> That's uh, so no one will know what that means. But towards the end of my father's life, he was hearing voices that simply weren't there. I don't, you know, we can debate as to why that was, but my hearing is fine and I could never hear these voices. And he was deaf and he could hear voices. Yeah. And one day I was eating lunch with him at his place at the old farm. And he looks up at me and says, Did you hear that? And I looked at him like, What? And he says, They just called you a knucklehead. <laughs> Tell me what you really think, Dad. (laughs) They just called you a knucklehead. And sometimes from the great beyond, I do hear him calling you a knucklehead. (laughs) It's that that I believe. (laughs) So for all you knuckleheads out there, from Dr. Peoples and 180 people who channel him (laughs) and myself, why can't I? Go for it. Mainly it's because I can't do the voice. Uh I can't do the voice. And you won't let me. I won't let anyone. I, it, I really, the, the, so my plan was to open the episode with the voice, and Allison was like, "Nope, uh-uh. nope. can't do it. Don't do there's it." There's a there's a phrase our good friend Serata once told me, which I, mean, I don't know. Maybe you'll have to edit this out, but it's it's a phrase that, like, when you get secondhand embarrassment so much, she used to call it when people would give her douche chills. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm a 
big secondhand embarrassment person. I mean, it's the kind of thing that actually kept me from being able to even the very first show that you did. All you wanted me to say was, don't look behind you, right? Or something like that. Oh, the very first Strange Familiar show. Very first Strange Familiar show. All you wanted me, you're like, you don't have to be involved. You don't have to be a co-host or anything like that. Can you just say, don't look behind you? Is that what you want me to say? Mm -hmm. I couldn't do it. Couldn't do it. I had to get our friend Joe to stand in for me and say Mm -hmm. it. I couldn't do it. So it's miraculous. But now you said it, and I can clip that out, and I can go back and replace it on the, yeah, that's true. Show, on the Strange Familiars remasters. <laughs> I guess that's a good lesson, too, in that we're all capable of change. There you go. Thanks, Dr. Peebles. Thank you, Dr. Peebles. What is this curiosity? I have several. Curious curiosity. Wow. This will cure all of your ills. Yeah? Yeah. I have quack medicine bottles. (laughs) All right. I'm going to have a selection of them, and then you can probably put them up on Etsy, kind of like we did when we had the little frozen Charlotte dolls, and people can choose Mm -hmm. which ones they want. I have a swamp tonic, which I think was supposed to be a malaria remedy. Okay. I have some tiny little caffeine bottles. I have... Just various embossed apothecary bottles from different pharmacies. So you can carry a little bit of the quack health movement with you. <laughs> what era are these? Um, late 1800s, early 1900s. The, oh, cool. The, the grand era of home remedies. All right. So I'll put a photo of one or more of them in the mm-hmm. show notes. If you click on that, it'll take you to the listing where you can choose the quack medicine bottle of your heart's desire. While you're at Etsy, make sure to check out our other offerings, other curiosities of the week, those that are left, antique photos from Allison. My books are there. All of them are in stock right now. If you order them from us, they come signed. You don't even have to ask. I'll sign them before we put them in the mailers. Artwork, original and prints, Strange Familiars t-shirts, stickers, and more. We've got the Flowered Path t-shirts there. It's been a big hit. People like that shirt. It is a nice graphic. But uh, there's not a ton left. 3XL and 2XL are sold out. So we have right now just small through XL in those and not too many of any size. So uh, get them while they're hot. Very soon there will be a new Stone Breast CD that has the Strange Familiar theme, the full theme. You never get to hear the full theme. There's two versions on the show. One's a little bit longer that I open with. Most often I use like the short opening, which is like a little bit less than a minute. That song's actually much longer. It has different parts to it. So you get the the full theme on that Strange Familiar CD. It's called Grays and Orphans. Uh, There's more unreleased songs on that as well. I'm releasing that at the same time I'm releasing a little book called Elzik's Farewell. It's just a little book, like seven by four or something, 48 pages, but it's a lot of the artwork I've done for Strange Familiars. And at the same time, I will put Entity Drift, which is the ambient music I did for Strange Familiars. I will put the physical version of that back in print as well. I'll make different packages so you can get book by itself or book with CDs or one CD or the other, etc. But that's all coming soon. And in celebration of that, the second patron show this month is Octavian and I discussing Stone Breath which I don't think I ever did on Strange Familiars before. At least I never did a a full show, I don't think. So he kind of interviewed me about Stone Breath. I told some stories about my favorite albums and so forth. We talk about its connection to the paranormal. So if you're a patron, you'll get to hear that for the second patron show for April, which is almost over. Yeah, it's this this month flew. It really did. What was the name of the first 7-inch? The first Stone Breath 7-inch was called Strange Familiars. Came it's full such a, circle. Such a good name that you had to use it twice. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> I, really, I, I had already released like a cassette, which probably like 10 people got or something. And I really should have called the band Strange Familiars mm-hmm. because I really liked that name. But I had already used the name Stone Breath and I thought I had to stick with it. So I called the first record Strange Familiars. And then years later, there were a couple other bands like that came after that. And I'm not saying they, they took the name from it. It's they could have come up with a name on their own, you know, that called themselves like Strange and the Familiars, or The Strange Familiar, different things like that. And I, like when I was starting the podcast, I was like, I really like that name. That'll be a good name for a podcast. So I just grabbed it. So yeah, kind of full circle. 
Back to uh, Stone Breath, The Strange Familiars, and back to Stone Breath. All right. Thanks for listening, everybody. We'll be back soon with more Strange Familiars. Strange Familiars is a production of Dark Holler Arts. Intro and background music is by Stone Breath. If you want to hear more or purchase music, you can go to stonebreath.bandcamp.com. Strange Familiars is on Facebook, facebook.com slash strange familiars. Stone Breath is on there too. <laughs> uh, strange Familiars is on Instagram, at strange familiars, one word. Stone Breath does not have an Instagram. <laughs> <laughs> And you can find us I on the have one, but it's hard to find. <laughs> you can find us on the web at strangefamiliars.com. Thank you.